Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Dewam, uh, the uh, managing partner for our employment law division at Michael Sullivan and Associates. I am joined here by my colleague and friend, Keith Figgins, who is the guru of all things workers comp. Uh, We're gonna go with that, Eric. That's okay. Right. <laughs> guru, that's my new title. Because Mike Sullivan isn't in the room. Um, <laughs> So uh, for those who are rejoining us from the first part of our webinar series uh, from this morning, uh, which started with uh, COVID-19 specific questions and issues that are raised in both workers' comp and employment law, um, we understand and we're hearing that there were some audio issues that we hope are resolved. Uh, message in if those have not been resolved yet. In any event, we're going to um, have a final recording that we'll distribute to everybody um, on those issues. And as we said before, um, the, the uh, COVID-19 uh, developments are hourly um, and they change as probably I'm speaking now. So we plan on updating as we go in the weeks to come, weeks and months to come anyway, um, but we'll get that uh, presentation to everybody. Um, so you, it answers some of the most fundamental questions. Um, this session is the interactive process and reasonable accommodations. Um, this was originally um, going to be an in-person uh, seminar um, with um, our friends, uh, Brett Strauss and Bertha Andretti um, out in Ontario, but because of uh, COVID-19, it was changed to a webinar. So we decided since we were addressing these issues anyway, that we'd have a two-part series for today. Hopefully you can hear this one. Um, I also wanted to point out before we get too far into this that the slides are all available for download in the chat window. So feel free to go into the chat window and download the slides. Um, just in case there is any problem with you hearing us, you can um, get all the information we're giving you off the slides. But please don't uh, sign off now because there's a lot of information not on the slides that Eric and I will be writing to you as well. Yeah, as you'll see, and it, anybody who has um, seen or heard us um, doing this before, no, we don't really go by the slides, um, but we go through real world applications. The slides won't have here any information on COVID-19, but we will be addressing that um, as we go. Um, so uh, let's skip, get right into it, uh, except for these pictures. Um, your picture, not my picture. I know, you're photogenic. That's um, three kids, a uh, marriage and 10 years of work comp ago. Yeah, mine Photoshop cannot save. Um, <laughs> so, okay, scope of the discussion today. Um, we're going to talk about um, workers' comp versus FEHA and the ADA, ADA being the federal law, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, FEHA, the state more constrictive law, Federal Employment and Housing Act. Um, we'll talk about the roles of the TPA versus the employer um, and return to work related injuries versus non-industrial injuries. Uh, we're going to get into and kind of um, timely is the definitions of disability, how they apply. Um, how it applies to the world we live in now um, and what you can and cannot do in the workplace. Uh, definitions of reasonable accommodations, uh, interactive process, and a medical documentation, fitness for duty exam, also timely because we get a lot of questions of, well, you know, can I take somebody's temperature? Uh, can I do a medical evaluation uh, at work? Um, we'll answer those questions. What to do with conflicting medical reports and uh, well, if we have time, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the difference uh, in, between litigating workers' comp and FEHA claims and uh, some opportunities that might be in there when you have an existing workers' comp claim for FEHA matters. Now, there's going to be some information here that seems to conflict between workers' compensation and FEHA and, e and ADA. Um, the information doesn't conflict. There's just different requirements. So sometimes workers' compensation, you have to do something, whereas FEHA, you wouldn't or ADA, you wouldn't, and vice versa. So we're going to try to point those things out as we go. This is a very um, intense uh, employment law presentation. However, if you do have workers' compensation questions, please feel free to put those into us and I'll answer those to the best of my ability. Yeah, it, a lot of times when we give this presentation, most of the time is spent answering questions. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult in this webinar form. Uh, that's why Keith and I like our in-person um, uh, presentations so we can get all dressed up for you and wear our bow ties. Well, okay, I wear, bow I wear the bow tie. <laughs> We do put on a show, though. We, we, we try to. We try to. Um, okay, so uh, FEHA and ADA um, and workers' comp. Uh, obviously, workers' comp applies to all employers. FEHA, ADA, FEHA is five or more employees, ADA, 15 or more. 
um, and both have the same requirements as providing reasonable accommodations to perform the essential job functions. Um, the, what that means gets sticky, so we're going to break it down as to definitions and examples of that. Um, and for this area of law, as many uh, employment-related laws, it's given the most deference to the employee. So they're given very broad uh, scope. Um, and typically, in California, unsurprisingly, uh, more employee um, friendly. Um, and it applies to both industrial and non-industrial injuries um, and disabilities. Uh, we put this slide up um, just because we, we often get the questions of, well, you know, we have a TPA, so can we have the TPA do it? And the answer is largely no. Um, they can be the go-between between, between um, you and the employee and the medical provider uh, to get um, certifications and clarifications, but everything else is on the employer. Um, there's no out by saying, well, I, I thought the TPA was going to do it. So the interactive process, squarely on the employer. Providing reasonable accommodations and determining whether you can do that, squarely on the employer. Um, identifying what the essential functions are, the same. Um, employer has to do those things. Um, and uh, so uh, TPAs are, are really great and essential for getting you the proper medical certification, which is often impossible at first to get. Um, but aside from that, um, the rest is on you. Okay, so definition of disability. Um, I'll just go through the, through the act, and this is the, the, the California version, which is the broader. It's a physical condition or disorder that affects a major bodily system that limits a major life activity. Same with mental disability. Um, it limits a major life activity. And what does limit me? And um, the, there is no bright line for us. It just essentially means it makes it more difficult. Are there limits to that? Um, is it a limit, you know, just because somebody has a few too many Bloody Marys on a Sunday and it makes it really difficult to come in on Monday, um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a disability. But um, these are given very broad meanings. Um, an example I typically give on this is a, um, a lawsuit, um, a trial that I was involved with. with. And it was a dis disability discrimination uh, case, two-week trial. And one of the first questions that go to the jury is, is it a disability? And in this case, the question was, was pneumonia, having two weeks of pneumonia, a disability under California law? Now, before anybody frets too much, we did win, of course, otherwise it probably wouldn't bring up this case. Um, but uh, the jury did come back, 12 jurors said, pneumonia was a disability. There was no discrimination, but they classified pneumonia as a disability. And why is that important now? How is that similar to COVID-19? Um, and that, that, there's an undefined question there. Does COVID-19, if somebody is diagnosed with it, limit a major life activity? Um, and I would err on the side of saying, Yes, but it also depends on the employee. This COVID-19 um, is statistically hitting people in different ways based on their demographic, their ages, et cetera. So um, for some people who have a diagnosis with COVID-19, it would not rise to the level of disability. And there are some that it, it definitely will. So that's going to be the issue you're going to have to grapple with. For my employers out there, I always recommend that when you're trying to determine whether you need to make an accommodation, um, err on the side of classifying it as a disability. That's usually not where you want to have your argument because um, the area of law is so broad for employees. Okay, essential job functions. What does that mean? Now, where you're going to find um, the uh, the definition of each job for your company is going to be in your job descriptions. So it's really critical that you have up-to-date, clear job descriptions for all of your employees. And that's going to become important, especially in the environment we're in now, um, because you're going to need to define what is essential for the job. We're in it, when we're in a mandated place where in some places, like the Bay Area, where employees are working remotely. Well, now is being at work 
an essential job function. Well, you let for you know a month, two months, we had to work from home, so maybe it's not an essential job function. Um, so my recommendation in this time, when it comes to making sure that your job descriptions and these essential functions stick, is when you're sending employees home, have an acknowledgement that they understand that this is for a temporary period. This is for an emergency period. Um, because they're working, just because they're working from home, when things return to normal, they are required to adhere to the regular essential functions of their job description, which may include um, working in the office. Now, Eric, would it be enough to just have in a, a job function or a job description that they have to work in the office without any rationale as to why they have to work in the office? So the way this this is as determined is the first evidence is a job description. If you don't have it in the job description, you're going to have a hard time trying to prove later that it's an essential job function. But it doesn't stop there because it has to actually be essential for their job. So just throwing it in there when the reality on the ground is it anybody could perform all of those functions and do just as good a job remotely from their computer as they could from in the office. So you would caution employers in this current environment to not just go out and change all their job descriptions to say work must be done in the office. Right. It, uh, and I wouldn't go into going into your job descriptions, especially at this point in time, trying to make them retroactively um, apply. Um, but I, I would do an acknowledgement that you expect them to return, and this is just for an emergency period. You will get um, people, you know, will push back at times and say, well, you know, I find it easier to work from home, or, and you're gonna have to get into an interactive process if they start saying that because it's related to a disability. Um, these are only kind of preventative measures ahead of time, seeing that that could potentially come down the line. So what does essential mean? Uh, the position exists for to perform that function. The extent the, the function can be performed by, a, by or distributed to others. The function requires high level of skill or expertise. The majority of the time is spent performing that function. Failure to perform the job function has legitimate business consequences. And a lot of the times the in-office work is going to be important when it comes to um, you know, peer collaboration, having somebody accessible to you without having to call them on the phone, um, it, it, depending on what types of jobs there are. So there's gonna be a lot of argument for many jobs that being in the office is an essential function, but you wanna try and preserve that during those uncertain times. Um, the other type of evidence we look at to what is an essential function when it's a, a disputed issue are performance reviews. One of the key points that both Keith and I um, try and emphasize to um, our employers is the training of your managers, your supervisors, your decision makers is pivotal. And that applies here. A lot of times performance reviews are done by the direct supervisor or the manager. And they don't have um, in mind um, complying with California law or determining that these are essential functions. But cases have said, if a performance evaluation um, does not list how people are performing these, what we're saying are essential functions, it may not be an essential job function. So not only should you have these accurate job descriptions, you should also have the managers and supervisors understanding the job descriptions and using them in your performance reviews. A absolutely. And I, um, I recommend that when they do the performance evaluations, they do them with the job description itself um, and evaluate each of those points. And you're going to shore up, um, if it's ever disputed later, what are exactly your essential functions. And why is that important? You have to come to a determination later of whether you can reasonably accommodate um, an employee who makes um, a request. So what do you do when uh, the employee returns to work? Um, always, always, always require a doctor's note or medical status report that clears them when they have been gone because of disability. The same applies now. Um, when people are sent home because they display symptoms, they actually have been diagnosed with COVID-19, they live with somebody who has been diagnosed with COVID-19, and they've disclosed that to you. Um, you can and you should require one that they that they go home for at least a 14-day period. And when they return, 
that they provide medical certification to come back to work, that they are cleared. Um, I, I think in this environment, it's not only a good idea, it may just be an absolute requirement on employers to make sure they're keeping a safe environment for the other employees when they have knowledge um, that somebody has been exposed um, until they can be cleared. Um, it, with that said, and I didn't mention it before, um, and we talked about this at the prior webinar, I, I get a lot of questions of, well, can I ask somebody if they're symptomatic? They don't look like they're well. Can I ask them if they're feeling fever or chills? Or, And the answer is, and um, there's some guidance on some of the websites like the EEOC, asking questions of flu or cold-like symptoms, including COVID-19 type symptoms, is not considered to be a disability inquiry. So that is absolutely permissible. Um, you may ask those questions. Um, if somebody's displaying symptoms, you should ask those questions. And if um, you come to a conclusion that they are displaying those symptoms, they should be sent home um, at least for a 14-day period. Um, okay, so getting back on track, determining uh, determine if the work restrictions that are in the medical certification are temporary or permanent. Um, that goes into an assessment of how long or if you can actually accommodate um, the request. Um, a lot of times, well, I won't even say a lot of times, almost every medical certification you're going to get is going to be deficient. Um, I haven't seen a really good one in a very long time that um, identifies very specifically what the restrictions are and what is expected from the employer. So uh, my employers and my TPAs out there have to be comfortable with kicking these back because it's critical in order to comply with these laws that the employer really understand what they need to do, what those restrictions are. And these medical notes are not helping um, and you have to press for them. So the question is, well, I, I, I pushed it back, but you know, we're not getting any response. It's been 10 days, what do I do? And this is the same if it's a workers' compensation claim. If it's a non-industrial injury, you should be kicking these back if you do not know what the restrictions are. I can't count. If I had a dollar for every time I saw a doctor say that the person cannot be in a stressful work environment, I'd be a very rich man. <laughs> what, stress? Really? <laughs> People have that at work? That's crazy. Not um, us, Eric. Not, not us. us. Never. <laughs> so relaxed. Um, so, the, and this is the thing. Um, when it comes to those notes, you, you, you kick them back, but if you don't get them right away, which you typically do not, and use your TPA for these um, as well, is you have to accommodate the employee in that interim period. So if they say that they can't bend or stoop, don't make your employee who's saying they have a disability bend or stoop because you don't have a proper medical note yet. Um, request the medical note, um, accommodate them in the interim. If you can't accommodate them on the job for those requests, then they likely will have to go home. Um, but give them a reasonable period of time to get the note back. And what's a reasonable period? Under FMLA guidelines, it's at least 15 days. So at least give them 15 days to get back with you with a proper medical certification. Um, but you want to be very lenient in that area because if, you, um, uh, if you're too quick to act, there's FMLA and CIFRA retaliation laws that may apply. So you want to be careful that you're giving them every opportunity to get the medical certifications to you. Um, when they return, we also recommend that, um, assuming everybody has their up-to-date, accurate, um, full job descriptions, that these employees review them when they return and they sign them when they return, acknowledging that they can perform all of the essential functions. Sign and date. Sign and date. Um, reasonable accommodations. Um, this is just about a bit of a difference between workers' comp and ADA. You want to talk about the workers' comp component? Yeah, so for workers' compensation, there's no requirement that the employer has to accommodate, accommodate any temporary modified duties. However, if they are not being accommodated, there are going to be benefits that are provided. The other going to be paying them temporary total disability, which is two-thirds of their average weekly wage, or you're going to be paying them some sort of temporary partial disability, which is basically just going to reflect some of their wage loss that they're experiencing as a result of you not um, accommodating those modified duties. But there is no requirement in the law, the labor code, regs, or case law that says that the employer has to accommodate modified duties within the workers' compensation system. So this is one of those examples I was talking about before, where workers' compensation, I don't recommend, I don't have to 
or I recommend that we don't have to accommodate. However, if you do not accommodate and you're required to under the ADA or FIHA, you are getting into a very bad situation. Yep. So this is where it's very important you discuss your cases, not only with a workers' compensation expert, but also an expert in employment law, because you're going to get two different answers. Yep, and the, and the answer here is different because in under ADA, it doesn't matter. You have to, if they have a disability, you have to go through the interactive process and you must consider reasonable accommod accommodations regardless. This is the the problem a lot of um, peop employers get into when they're assuming because they've complied with workers' comp that they're good. Um, and they don't get into the further ADA, FIHA, FMLA, CIFRA, those, you know, LMNOP, um, every other type of leave and issue that might be out there. Um, and that's why it's important to have experts in both areas to make sure you're compliant. And it's it's not easy to navigate. Um, okay, employers must accommodate these requests for disabled individuals unless it's an undue hardship. The undue hardship exception, I am telling you, is a difficult um, bar to meet. And most employers are not, unless they are a very small employer, um, are not going to be able to meet the undue hardship. My recommendation, if that is where you are going, is that you do a very thorough documentation of why fiscally, financially, you cannot, as the employer, accommodate the request. Um, the more objective that is, the more we can use that defense. Um, but more often than not, um, it, it's, it's usually not recognized as a solid defense in these cases. Um, Again, there's no bright line test um, on how long is too long for leave. That's the question I get every time we do this. Well, they wanted, you know, two months. Is two months too long? Um, how about three months? I wish I could give you an answer. And it's uh, and I've seen cases of an excess of a year where it wasn't too long for a requested leave as an accommodation for a disability. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. It's an employer-by-employer -employer analysis basis. It's a job-by-job -job analysis. Um, so there is no clear-cut rule. I really like how hard you're trying to not say it depends, Eric. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear the lawyer say it depends. And I have, I have, Eric just really went out of his way not to say it depends. I'm, I'm really impressed with that, Eric. <laughs> because they hate it when I say that. But I'm surprised I haven't said it a bunch already. But it depends. So, um, but, but that is... I, that's what we struggle with is this leave time um, most. Uh, what I can tell you, and please don't make the mistake, a lot of employers still ask me, well, there are 12 weeks of FMLA and CIFRA up. That was accommodating. I can let them go now. And the answer to that is eh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Something certainly past 12 weeks is um, is in the reasonable realm. So would you not recommend employers have a policy where we have 60 days or 90 days of temporary work assignment available, Eric? I, I love it that you know my pet peeves, <laughs> and absolutely not. And that's, it, it's, um, it's, I see it more often than I would like, <laughs> where employers want to put a cap in their policies of what is reasonable. And the problem with doing that is that you have provided um, Exhibit A, and I'm hearing a little bit of feedback myself. Uh, that might have been me leaning on the cord. Sorry. <laughs> um, it is that you've provided Exhibit A that you have not engaged in the interactive process. So the if you put that into your employee handbook, um, that's going to be the first exhibit that the opposing counsel is going to use to show that you're not engaging in the interactive process. Absolutely. Because interactive process is a separate requirement. Even if you are right, even if three months, four months, six months a year should be the cap, that is reasonable, you will still lose on the um, interactive process requirement to have the discussion first with the employee before you make that assessment. So this is another one of those examples when we're talking about workers' compensation. There's no requirement, there's no punishment if you do have that um, limitation on temporary work assignments in the workers' compensation system. However, if you do have those 
restrictions, you could be um, violating other laws outside of the workers' compensation system. Yep, and most likely are. <laughs> so it's important that risk management and HR are talking to one another when they're dealing with these issues. Yeah, that's one of our big um, pitches to our clients is to make sure that HR and risk managers are speaking with each other and, um, and utilizing both uh, employment law and workers' comp um, experts. Um, as we go, we're going to look at some, we're getting some questions in. We'll try and pepper those in as we go. Um, but let's move on to this slide right now. Um, what can be reasonable accommodations? Uh, those would be a change in policy, practice, or procedure, um, a change in supervisory methods, and that doesn't mean a change in supervisor. Um, I see all too often, um, I have a disability, I don't like my supervisor, um, I want another one, and that is not a reasonable accommodation. What is, is training that supervisor of how to handle that particular employee um, and that particular disability. That would be an accommodation, but just getting the request that, to change a supervisor, um, uh, those are not reasonable. Um, change in schedule, telecommuting, um, additional breaks, eliminating non-essential job functions. Again, non-essential, you're not required to get rid of essential job functions, and use of AIDS devices, et cetera. Um, and reassignment to vacant alternative positions. You do not have to create a new position. Um, and there, if you have a meritocracy, um, you don't necessarily have to give it to a person who is disabled first. But if you don't have a meritocracy, they would get priority on vacant positions. What is not a reasonable accommodation? Offering a temporary job. Um, they can reject a temporary job offer in our ADA FIHA world and you still have to go through the inquiry of what other accommodations can be provided. Um, create a new position, don't have to do that. And so in the workers' compensation system, if you offer a employee a temporary job and they reject it, that will affect their benefits. They're not gonna be getting that temporary disability if you've made them an offer of a job and they are rejecting it. Yep, but if they offer it and you're engaging in the interactive process for going forward, you can't just let them go because they didn't take that temporary job. Um, you have to try and find other means, which is typically more leave time um, in that case. Um, you don't have to uh, transform a temporary light duty position into a permanent one. This is an important one to keep in mind. Many employers have light duty position for positions for people who have an industrial injury um, or who are requesting um, an accommodation. Make sure you keep these light duty positions um, temporary, um, that the employee knows this is for a 90 day period. We will assess at the expiration of those 90 days whether we can accommodate further. The reason for that being, you don't want the employee there for two, three, I've seen five years in a temporary light posi position because it's become their position now. A very good argument it has. So unless you are um, on top of the your calendar and how long people have been in these temporary um, light positions, uh, light duty positions, you um, you may be transforming it into a permanent one. So we do acknowledge this is a very difficult situation to go in because you're not allowed to just cut somebody off of a temporary position for no reason. But you're also not you also shouldn't be keeping them in a temporary position for an extended period of time. Yep. So that's a very difficult um, inquiry to go through, right, Eric? It is. And if if you are on top of it, you're going to have a good ar argument that um, case law says I don't have to make a temporary light duty position a permanent one. I don't have to make it your permanent position. Now, we all like bright line rules. Uh, yep. This, as of one year, this is no longer a temporary position. This yep. is permanent. But those bright rules just don't exist you, here. You can't do that. You always have to leave an opening that we will discuss it at the end of this to see if we can reasonably accommodate for a further period of time. So this comes down to communication with the employee. The interactive process. The interactive the process. The interactive process, <laughs> always. Um, you don't have to lower quality and quantity of work standards. Um, and again, you don't have to change supervisors. And as we all wish we could eliminate stress, it is not a reasonable accommodation to eliminate stress. And if there is a job out there that doesn't have it, I would like to know what it is. Okay. Um, interactive process, we've already been talking about this. And it is an independent um, uh, claim 
It's an independent obligation that carries with it, if violated, attorney's fees, punitive damages, back wages, front wages, side wages, um, everything uh, that the other claims do. So you have to stay on top of the interactive process component. And when does it start? As soon as you're aware of even a non an industrial injury in the workers' comp sector, your interactive process obligations begin. Um, don't assume because you have a TPA there that you're fulfilling your interactive process obligations. HR needs to be on top of it. Um, the communications need to be there. And ideally, where possible, it's documented that that is happening. Um, because just saying, yeah, I called them and I asked them is usually not enough. Um, and do you have to create a document every time? What I recommend is at least you formalize it in an email to yourself that it happened so we have the document later to show um, your efforts in going into the interactive process. All right. Um, talked about that already. Can be done via phone. Okay. It can be done by phone, email, um, face to face. I, uh, everybody prefers a face to face conversation because you get so much more out of a face to face conversation when you're trying to figure these things out by, um, by cues, by tone. Um, sometimes that can't happen. If somebody is out of work because they have a disability, you can't drag them into the office just so you can have a face-to-face -face interactive process. Um, so you might have to do it by phone. You have to document the, the conversations. Um, and once you come to an agreement of what those accommodations are, send it to the employee to confirm that's what you agreed to. Now, Eric, can you engage in the interactive process without the employee present? So let's say you've sent them an email, you've called them, you've requested that they come in and meet, and they just have not responded to you. Yep. Can, can you meet your obligations without them there? You can, because it's a two-way street obligation. Uh, the law isn't um, clear on who has to start it, but it is clear if you know that there's a disability or potential disability out there, um, you have to you have to begin the conversation. But the and, employer is not going to be waived of their obligations of the interactive process if the person does not call them back or respond back. Well, is that right? It's not waived, but the defense is it's a it's a um, a two party obligation. They both have to interact. So if the employee is not responding to your emails, if the employee is not responding to your calls, um, and certified mail, which I like to use um, to prove that they got it. Um, then you can start considering whether or not they've, um, uh, one, they should be um, discharged for failure to engage in the interactive process with you, or two, whether if they haven't just shown up and they haven't um, responded to your emails, calls, texts, et cetera, whether they've abandoned their job. And I've seen that happen before. Do that with caution because you want, especially if you know that there's a disability issue out there, they might not be responding because they're in the hospital, right? Um, so take those types of issues in to consideration if you already know that there's a there's a disability in play. Um, let's see. The best practice of checking in with employees. I have um, I hear from both both angles, and I understand from both angles. Some HR people say I don't want us calling in because I don't want them to say I'm pressuring them to come back to work, which is a legitimate concern. How I see this play out on the ground is um, is different. What I see when I'm deposing these people who have ultimately sued their employer is words to the effect of, I worked for this company my, you know, the majority of my life. I was there for 25, 30 years, um, dutiful employee, and I just took one leave of absence. I didn't hear a word from them. Not a get well soon, not a flower, not a call. Um, and they are hurt by it. They feel unappreciated. And um, these are, and this isn't once I've seen this. I've seen this dozens and dozens of times. And so a call in can go a long way by the right person. You don't want, you know, that eager manager supervisor giving a call and using the wrong language that implies get your butt back to work. Um, you want somebody who understands the issues. And it's a call in to say, hey, I just want to check in on you. We want you um, uh, to get better. Just want you to know we're thinking of you. Um, keep us posted. That's it. 
Um, you don't want to have any language in there to the extent that they feel pressured in any way. Um, but I do think it's a good idea to do that. Um, TPA, getting clarification, we talked about that. Uh, use them where you can to uh, get clarification on notes during this interactive process period so you can identify what accommodations you actually uh, need to make or consider. Uh, we have this graph on here basically to tell you it doesn't matter if it's a work-related injury, uh, modified duties uh, with temporary restrictions, permanent restrictions, or if it's a non-industrial, um, you always have to engage in the interactive process um, at all stages. And this looks like a workers' comp thing, so I'm shutting up now. This is a workers' compensation <laughs> thing. So this, the, these next couple of slides are meant not to direct your behaviors as the employer. They're just meant to show that there are some impacts on whether or not offers of work are made to injured employees once they've been considered permanent and stationary. There are impacts on the workers' compensation claim outside of a DA FIHA. So basically, um, the return to work voucher, um, between the, for dates of injury between January 1st, 2004 through January 1st, 2013, um, if there is a valid return to work offer to the employee encompassing um, work restrictions by the proper physician that last at least 12 months, wages um, paid uh, and compensation within 15% of those paid at the time of injury, and the job is located within a reasonable commuting distance of the employee's residence at the time of injury, not the current uh, residence, but the um, residence at the time of injury, then the employee or the employer would not be liable for a voucher if they extended that valid offer of modified or alternative work. Um, as long as it's within 30 days of the termination of temporary disability and the employee returns to work or within 30 days of termination of temporary disability and the employee either rejects, fails to accept, and does not or does not physically return to work in the job being offered. So this has an impact on the benefits that are paid to the injured worker at the time of permanent stationary status within 30 days after temporary disability has been paid. Now this law did change in on January 1st, 2013. So how the uh, return to work voucher is applied did change as of, as of that date. So Rick, if you wanna. Oh, my job, there you go. So, uh, this is basically just going over again what we're talking about in terms of who would be li who would be entitled to the voucher and when the employer is liable for the voucher. So the criteria that has to be met is whether or not there's permanent partial disability. So that's anything but 0% permanent disability. So if you're doing a STIP for 0% permanent disability, this wouldn't apply and you stop the inquiry there. But um, if the employer does not offer modified work within 30 days of termination of temporary disability benefits, the voucher would be owed and there is permanent disability. If the injured worker does not return to work for the employer within 60 days of the termination of temporary disability benefits, or if it's a seasonal worker, um, if the employee cannot return to work within 60 days of the termination of temporary disability benefits, because the season has ended, then did the injured employee not return to work at the next available work date on the next available work season? So these are things that you have to take into account when you're looking at whether or not a voucher is gonna be owed. The purpose of this voucher is going to be re to retrain the employee. It's going to be to provide them classes and equipment in order to engage in a new job when they're no longer able to do their old job because of the restrictions that were um, provided to them based on their injury at work. So this would not apply to any non-industrial injuries. This would only apply to industrial injuries within the workers' compensation system. So now, I indica as I indicated before, the law changed on January 1st, 2013. So as of dates of injury for January 1st, 2013, the valid offer of return to work would need to include wages and compensation, at least 15% of those paid to the employee at the time of injury. So that hasn't changed, just the wording has. Before it was within 15%, now it's 85% of those wages and compensation. The job still must be within reasonable commuting distance of the residents at the time of injury. Um, and this will be waived if you make a offer of a job, let's say um, 50 miles away, but the person doesn't object within 20 days of being informed of the right to object. And the work must be at least for 12 months. So it can't be for 11 months or nine months, it must be for at least 12 months. Um, the employer will be eligible for the voucher if they have permanent partial disability. So again, that's anything above 0%. And the offer of work is not made within 60 days of receipt 
of the treating physician or panocumi or AMEs return to work and voucher report. Now that return to work voucher report is not the narrative report you receive from the doctor. It's not the permanent stationary report. It's a one page um, report that gives a very detailed idea of each and every duty, each and every activity and ability that that person can and cannot do. So a lot of these vouchers aren't going out by doctors, but we really should be pushing back to these doctors and requesting that we do get these return to work um, reports because they are much more engaged and they're much more detailed than just a narrative report where a doctor has the ability to say in one sentence, no stressful work environment, um, no walking ever. Like, how does that even happen? How can that work? So that voucher report doesn't allow them to do that. They have to check boxes. In my experience, when you're asking doctors to check boxes and you're requiring them to check those boxes, they're much more likely to give you restrictions that you're actually able to understand and apply on a daily basis um, within your company. <clears throat> Ooh, that looks like me. This that's is definitely a, that's a me yeah. thing. Before I get to the hypo, um, we have a few we have a few questions that um, we'll try and throw in here. So we're doing okay on time. Uh, one What's of them first, Eric. I know, right? <laughs> um, so far, anyway. Uh, the first question is: There any issue with um, asking staff if they fall into a high risk group? In quotes, um, I, I'm assuming to ask staff to go, uh, I guess, to not, to work remotely or work from home, uh, but not specify which group. So, if I'm understanding the question right, it's a scenario where, where for example, uh, you have a group of individuals who are, I guess, in a high-risk group, maybe over 60. Um, is there a problem with sending that group home? And I expect the answer to that is absolutely yes, because what you're going to have is a potential discrimination case based on age. Um, although there are demographics out there and statistics of people that might be more at risk, um, we should not be making decisions based on what we project they might be a higher risk person. There is, um, and, I, and I put it in the prior webinars uh, slides, it's not here, but it's available on our prior webinar slides and on the EEOC website, um, a questionnaire that you can distribute that's approved to employees that ask them general questions um, uh, such as how they're gonna be impacted if schools are closed, um, do they or somebody they live with have a condition that might expose them uh, or be higher risk for a particular condition? Um, it's, a, it's a series of four questions and it's evenly distributed and all the employee does is answer yes or no at the bottom. Um, uh, they don't say which applies to them, but they just say yes or no. And it's not anonymous that you know who, it, who, who does it and you can assess who, um, you can at least assess how it's gonna impact your workforce going forward. You shouldn't be using that to take people off work because you project that they are a higher risk person. Um, and the the big picture um, rule I want everybody to consider is when we're implementing these rules, and there's a lot we can do. We see people with symptoms, we can send them home. We require them to have medical certifications. If somebody is traveling to um, a country or traveling from a country home, that um, is known to have um, high-risk conditions, for example, Italy, um, we can require them to stay home for 14 days and get a medical certification to come back. The way we need to handle this, though, is evenly for all employees. The problem with that I see in the future are employers who are not evenly distributing these rules. Um, and it's going to turn into discrimination, retaliation types of claims. So if you're going to implement these rules, implement them consistently throughout your organization um, and, and, um, and keeping that in mind. Now, Eric, if you use that four question um, questionnaire that you send out to all of your employees, are you allowed to go out as the employer and ask them questions about that questionnaire? No, it's, okay, it's so a very, yeah, the EEOC has made it, it, they gave us this one, you know, approved ADA compliant questionnaire. Um, and it's really just meant to be used pre-pandemic to assess how it's going to impact your workforce. So should it be used to determine who, which employees could go home? Yeah, and I, and I think it makes sense, especially with when you're creating contingency plans and you have a large either statewide or um, national 
organization of determining you know who to send home first the people who are directly impacted um you know the people who have who are affected with their the school closures or answer you know yes to these questionnaires have them go home first and you're doing it for everybody in that class um that have answered yes um and that might make it easier as we go forward um to do uh, send employees home remotely later I have a lot of employers who had solid, good contingency pl contingency plans that we put in place um, before the closures, the self shelter uh, shelter in place um, in the Bay Area, and they were in a good place because they were prepared for it, um, and now they're preparing for it, and they're already prepared for it for other areas of the state. Um, the next question is, what can be some of the restrictions we may come across with this virus? Um, the, the one obvious one is going to be time and leave. Uh, another one I expect is going to be people who do have um, compromised immune systems um, who are going to ask to work remotely for a period of time, especially until we are in a contained um, environment. So, um, I, I, and this is a, th we're going to be seeing um, lots of new case law come out on this, I guarantee it. Um, we we want to be as, especially when it comes to people who have been diagnosed or affected by COVID-19, we want to be very flexible um, because this has affected um, the world. Um, so people are going to be very empathetic um, to these conditions. Uh, what we're going to see, I can only guess because I think there's going to be a lot, it changes day by day. Uh, what is actually going to happen is uh, I think we're going to have some new laws that come out and uh, definitely new case law uh, that's going to come out as a result of this. Um, if an employer can provide modified work, but employees reject it, do you now proceed to leave under ADA? Yes. Um, as we were talking about before, um, you could, if an employee rejects modified work, it'll affect their um, benefits under workers' comp but you still have to um, consider leave or other accommodations under the ADA. And the last question is, uh, we're a staffing company and have no permanent positions. If employee comes back with permanent restrictions that none of our clients' uh, positions would be available to perform, um, what do we do? So um, and this is a staffing agency employer joint employer issue as well. Um, I, I won't get too deep into it, but uh, even if you don't have permanent positions because you're a staffing agency, um, you are still required to um, provide and get inter engaged in the interactive process with these employees. So if somebody has a permanent restriction of um, lifting over 25 pounds, um, you are under a requirement to search for positions um, that are open within uh, the agency and with your available clients um, that can accommodate a position of that can only lift um, under 25 pounds. Um, you at least have to go through that process to um, ensure you're satisfying the interactive process component. Um, also in there becomes joint employment re relationships and who is the employer. Um, and there are there is case law depending on what the relationship really is that staffing agencies can be a joint employer with their clients, um, particularly under A B five. Um, and I mentioned it in the last webinar, but I do miss the days where A B five was our only big problem we had to talk about. Um, <laughs> those are those are the good old days. Um, but one of the issues with A B five is that certified to the Supreme Court is whether. Um, it applies, and the Dynamex decision applies to an analysis of whether there is joint employment. Um, there's some case law, appellate case law, that says no, but it's been certified to the Supreme Court, so we still don't know the answer to that. Okay, now back to the hypo. And okay, um, on a Monday, an employee who has been employed for uh, 18 months, but with a long pattern of documented performance issues is told to come in early Tuesday for a meeting with human resources. Dun, dun, dun. It's going to do that. <laughs> um, human, we have too much fun. Human resources had been uh, leaning towards terminating the employee, 
but wanted to give him one last chance. He then no call no shows for three days in a row and calls to his home to inquire about his well-being are unanswered. Friday morning, his girlfriend calls and reports that uh, he is depressed and unable to return to work until Monday. On Monday, he presents a note that states he cannot endure stressful interactions, will require additional breaks, and will need to periodically take off work for appointments. When HR attempts to discuss the situation with him, uh, he becomes agitated and insists his doctor will not permit it, but his girlfriend can be available to discuss. So um, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, the first question I typically ask when we're in person with everybody is, well, can he use his girlfriend um, as a go-between for this? And almost unanimously, I hear the answer of, no, he can't do that. Um, and then I smile and I say, but yes, he can. Um, he and then can. gasps. <gasps> no. <laughs> but the way they do, they, he has to do it is um, have a document signed of what the parameters are of what you can discuss with his girlfriend. This could be an accommodation under ADA and FIHA. Um, I recommend that you have a very detailed document that he signs that outlines what the scope is you can discuss with her. Um, what should HR have done in this case? Um, the big mistake here is that they waited until Friday. If they had gone with their decision to terminate him and he doesn't, he no call, no shows for those per that period of time, um, they were within their rights and could have discharged him um, without concern. But once they are aware of a potential disability um, on Friday, now they have to do an inquiry um, on accommodation. And if they terminate him on Friday after they learn this, what they are exposed to is retaliation. So um, some, a lot of times the one last chance uh, doctrine usually does not go favorably for the employer. I understand why people do it, but, um, but use your discretion. Um, on the types of uh, restrictions that are here, cannot endure stressful interactions. Um, well, good luck with that. We already talked about that, not gonna happen. Um, but you do wanna kick this note back to, to find out what does that mean. Um, I, in a lot of times when I, we kick those note, notes back, it's about the supervisor uh, and some type of supervisor relationship issue. Um, will require additional breaks. That is something you may, uh, most likely will have to entertain. Um, and, but what does that mean? How long, how many? Uh, is it, you know, uh, did the, you know, another 10 minute, another 15 minute? Um, is it every 30 minutes? Um, you need to find that out. And we'll need to periodically take off work for appointments. Again, get specific and find out what exactly that means so you can make a an informed decision. Okay, there's more in there, but for time's sake, we'll move on. So actually, there's a oh. question that just came in that works oh. out really well. Now, if you go to the next slide, that works out really well with this medical certification. Okay. So the question was, what's our opinion of dis uh, discouraging the requirement for a medical certification for time off related to COVID-19? What is our, what's our uh, recommendations for um, discouraging the requirement of medical certification for taking time off due to COVID-19? So not requiring a medical report if somebody's feeling symptoms. And I mentioned it before, um, in this environment, if somebody has um, displayed symptoms and they're sent home, I recommend that they come back with a medical certification. So what about if somebody is saying, you know, I just don't, I don't feel well. I don't want to get my other coworkers sick. Um, there are, there's an attest, so I don't know if I have yep. the virus. Should I, you be requiring them to have a medical note in order to go off work? I, I would, I would still do that so long as you're doing it consistently. If you're doing it consistently, I would still do that because, and the reason being, um, I see a world where people, you know that people displayed symptoms, you let them come back three or four days later, and then they expose other employees um, to those symptoms. And then you get into OSHA um, potential violations, potential, I, I guess, workers' comp um, components to it. Um, so there's nothing, if somebody has displayed symptoms, returning back with a medical certification, I think is reasonable and it's within their rights. 
Um, Should you require a doctor's note to go off of work though in the in the first place? I would not require a doctor's note okay. to go if that was a question. No, I would not. If somebody is displaying symptoms, absolutely do not require a doctor's note. Um, we want to encourage them to be responsible citizens, yeah. and if they are not feeling well, they should not be coming to work. Yeah, and, and the same applies for when somebody says, I have, I, I don't have my note for my doctor, um, but they have a disability where they cannot perform their functions. Um, you don't make them perform the functions of that day because you don't have a medical note. So if they're obviously struggling, pushing a wheel, yeah. wheelbarrow yeah. full of concrete. You're gonna have, you're gonna have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you send people home and wait for a certification. If somebody is displaying symptoms, do you require them to get certified? I don't think so. Um, and, and, and I think if you are going to make those requirements, you have to be consistent because I can see a world where people are requiring it of some that they don't trust and not of others. Our general recommendation has been um, so far that based on what's going on right now, um, just within the world in general, it's, it's an unusual time. And so it requires us to be flexible in terms of what we're requiring, what we're not requiring. So in this current um, pandemic that we're dealing with, we have not been recommending that you require a medical note if somebody's requesting to go off work because they feel some sort of symptoms. Now, the other things to keep in mind, which we usually don't do a lot of crossover in this presentation, but I think it's important for the purposes of COVID-19, are considering FMLA and CIFRA leave. If people are saying they're taking off because they're displaying symptoms and they believe they may have it, but um, testing isn't available, um, consider uh, whether their CIFRA or FMLA leave should be running and send the appropriate documentation to them to have filled up by the medical provider. Um, to determine the underlying, uh, is it a, um, a serious health condition? Um, and if it meets the requirements under either FMLA or CIFRA. Um, other leaves are going to be implicated as well um, for tw employers with 25 or more employees. Um, you, they, and they have issues with schools closing. Um, you may have to give them up to, in this emergency state, up to 40 hours a year of unpaid leave. Um, then there's also paid sick leave considerations um, that go into the equation. It seems to me at this point we want to err on the side of caution. Yep. Um, there is potential for serious and willful claims if the employers are ignoring employees saying that they are feeling sick and then somehow the virus gets spread around in the in the um, workplace. So these are some things that we want to avoid and it's um, we're avoiding these other potential lawsuits by planning well and taking caution. Yep, that's good advice. I, um, when, you're, when you're doing this analysis, whoever is in charge of these leaves, I, I would you know, assign you know, a person who really understands the, um, the complexities of it and knows to document what type of leave people are going on. Are they going on a three-day paid sick leave under California statutes? Are they going on FMLA CIFRA? Um, are they going on school-related activity leave? Um, and they're documenting it because I guarantee you at the end of this, it's going to be important to be able to identify why people were gone, under what leaves were they gone. So we don't want to just be reactive right now. You want to make sure you're still following the appropriate laws. You're still labeling the appropriate leaves the way that they should be labeled yep. and not waiting to clean it up later after all this has gone away. Because honestly, we honestly don't know how long it's going to take for this to be cleared up. We don't. We hope it's, you know, it's going to be short lived, but the, the likelihood is it's going to be definitely longer than we hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it already yeah, is. It already is. <laughs> um, so one of the things, um, and I don't want to forget to bring it up um, since we're talking about leaves is HR 6201, which is the federal bill that's trying to be passed by Senate. Last time I checked, which was this morning, it still had not passed Senate. Um, this is the bill that, among other things, um, expands FMLA and expands paid sick leave obligations. Um, the bill, as it was passed by the House last week, um, uh, provided for uh, 12 weeks of protected leave related to um, COVID-19. The difference between this and uh, and the regular FML leave is that this would be um, paid um, for 10 of the 12 weeks um, at a particular rate, depending on whether it's to care for uh, a family member or for yourself. Um, that 
uh, and the paid sick leave as it was written as of last week was for up to 14 days of paid leave. Um, so we have to keep an eye on that because those are going to be implemented um, in some form soon. My last check is this has been whittled down to now potentially 10 days of paid sick leave and um, that the conditions for the FMLA emergency leave have been whittled down to just to care for an individual who has been uh, who is home uh, because of closures. Um, but that's the last time I checked. It might be different now, um, but we have to keep an eye on that one because it's definitely going to have implications on California law. It is in addition to what we already provide. So you can't, as it's written, we can't um, enforce what they already have in the bank for paid sick leave before they use it. They can use this new paid sick leave first before they go into the other banks. Um, but we'll we'll try and update as the weeks go on as things change on that. So um, second opinion um, on medical certifications. When uh, you doubt the medical certification, do these with caution. Um, a lot of employers have knee-jerk reactions that they don't trust a doctor, that doctor's a hack, they'll sign anything. Um, we're not medical uh, professionals and don't read into a medical note. You can require it be, that it be more detailed, um, but if you're going to push back on a note because you don't believe the doctor is qualified, um, it, 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 it's a hard sell. Um, now, if it's a uh, chiropractors do count as medical you know, providers that can write certifications, believe it or not. Um, oh, sorry, my chiropractor's out there. Um, and But it, can a chiropractor give you um, mental health um, certifications? Uh, I would argue probably not. Um, but take those on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a hard argument to make. You can do um, second opinions if the medical certification does not match up with what you're seeing. If you have a good faith and objective reason to disbelieve um, the certification. Um, and, and we'll get into a little bit of that on fitness for duty exams. Oh, well, so um, this question? actually, this question I think was just answered. Um, is a doctor's note from a chiropractor considered <laughs> a valid healthcare provider? So. <laughs> wow, I'm reading somebody's mind. I love it. I don't know who you are out there, but. Um, okay, so yes, depend. It, 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 yes, say it, it, yes, say it, it. it. Say it, Eric. It depends. It depends. <laughs> Sorry, people. Um, Let's see. Uh, I think we've kind of talked about most of this. Um, again, when it comes, and I hear this more and more, is you know how long do I have to wait for a medical certification? The, the rule is a reasonable time. So, um, so be very wary of um, discharging an employee because they haven't come back with a medical certification, um, and at least 15 days most likely up to 30, um, but that again, that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, let's see. Okay, seeking additional examinations. Um, I'm gonna skip down to um, the fitness for duty exam because that question comes up a lot. Um, I have employers who often want to, uh, when somebody's coming back from an FMLA leave um, or CIFRA leave, Say, I'm going to have them do a fitness for duty exam before they come back. And the answer typically to that is you don't. Um, the purpose of these types of leaves, leaves are for the employee to convalesce and be able to return back to work. So if they have a note, which you are requiring, that says may return to work with no restrictions, and they come back that first day and clearly cannot climb a ladder and clearly cannot bend past their waist, um, you're seeing objective um, reasons that this note is not complying with what you are seeing. Um, you may have a, a, the ability to do a fitness for duty exam by an independent medical examiner at your cost, um, but do those again with, with caution. Um, more detail on, and this is here for you just to kind of go through what the requirements are for fitness for duty. One of the things I'll highlight um, and is underlined that the reason you're sending them to this for this fitness for duty is job related. It's because of um, an essential duty that, that you see they can't perform um, is why you're sending to them to a fitness for duty. The danger zone I see employers get into is that they want to do this because a, of a what they believe might be a mental health condition. 
they're assuming because of conduct that there's a mental health condition and that is absolutely a danger zone for you um, you need absolute objective medical evidence that one that they can't perform the essential functions of their job that you're seeing somebody else is seeing with you um, or two that there's a direct threat um, to your um, your other employees um, or your clientele and direct threat is a very high threshold to meet um, and I talked a little bit about this when it comes to COVID-19 and you know taking temperatures of employees that you think might be sick that might not be being honest with you um, COVID-19 I do not believe based on CDC so far is a direct threat to the extent where you can perform any type of medical examination on the ground we are not there yet um, so if somebody's displaying symptoms send them home um, but I would not cross the threshold of doing any type of medical evaluation on them um, I think I can get off my soapbox on this one <laughs> yeah all good I think so okay um, what to do with conflicting medical reports I get this question all the time Eric yeah. all yeah. the time and, and it happens mostly in the workers comp world because we don't see them as much in the strictly non-industrial ADA FIHA world and so but, the recommendation we typically give is you have to be consistent right yep. so you can't um, just make up random rules about what you're going to do on a case-by-case -case basis you should be consistent now whether that consistency is taking the most recent report taking reports that are substantial medical evidence you should have a uh, plan you should have a rule that you follow consistently for each and every case yep and um and correct me if i'm wrong in the rule for in the ada fiha world is um that you have to evaluate it at uh, globally you can't just take the most recent report um you can't take the report that you just happen to trust the most or the one that you uh, like the most or the one that, that suits you best <laughs> um it it's uh you have to one if there's conflicting medical reports the first thing you do is you talk to the employee we have two reports here one of them says you can never um uh, bend stoop climb the other says you have no restrictions what is really happening here what can you really do and not do and if they say i have um no restrictions um then you send it back with uh to get a, a clear medical certification with both notes to that doctor who gave them no restrictions to clear them um, with no restrictions now if they come back with no restrictions you have to abide by that note until you see they cannot perform the job and that's where fitness for duty comes in so this is another example of workers compensation and employment law kind of conflict because if we have an ame so the agreed medical evaluator between the parties in the work comp system typically unless it's not substantial medical evidence for whatever reason you're going to be relying on the ame report to make a determination on disability status um, impairment um, estimates of future medical care you're going to be using that report however it's not necessarily going to be used in the same way in the employment law um, area right Eric yep that's absolutely true now um, correct me if I'm wrong because I'd never um, professed to know anything about workers comp that's why I have you're you. learning a little uh, something Eric. I, come I, on once one, one or two things <laughs> enough to be dangerous um, but didn't wasn't there a recent case law on this about using conflicting medical reports something that I saw so you know I have seen some um, employers who there if there is a conflicting medical report there um, their rule is that they will go back to occupational medicine. So they'll go to a different doctor that's not either the primary treating physician or the AME or PQME, and they'll go to occupational medicine and they will ask the doctor to determine work restrictions, and they'll rely on that um, doctor in order to determine work restrictions. That's perfectly okay. The problem is, is that if it's not followed in every case, if there is conflicting medical reports and you don't um, follow that exact procedure that you set out as the employer, you're opening yourself up to a 132A discrimination claim because then you're not following the own, your own rules you set out and you're discriminating against on that employee um, because you're not following that rule. So if you do have rules on how best to um, you know, break the tie between the AME or QME and the PTP, you need to make sure you're following that rule. So it's not just enough to have the rule, that you actually have to follow it as well. It's consistency. Exactly. Yep. Sounds good. Accommodate, oh, are we, oh my gosh, wait a second. Accommodation checklist, usually I don't bring this up until the end. Oh no, we have some more slides, Never mind. We do. Um, so we do have um, accommodation checklists available 
for all of you. If you want them, please send us uh, an email um, and we will um, respond to those with the um, accommodation checklist and uh, some template letters. And, and these template letters are great because you can basically use them and cut and paste them into whatever format you want to use them as. Yep. And so just making sure that all of your language is consistent. Yep, uh, it's, a, it, it's something we provide and we update. Um, so hopefully that's helpful um, for everybody. Uh, we, br we bring this up at the end, litigating workers' comp and FIHA claims, um, because there, uh, there is case law out there that indicates how you handle a workers' comp claim may have a direct impact on the viability of a FIHA claim. So um, workers have two avenues. They have, if they have an industrial injury or a claim for a psych injury, um, that's related to discrimination or harassment, whatever that might be, um, to do a workers' comp claim. And they can also bring a FIHA claim um, saying they were discriminated, harassed, um, et cetera. Um, and a lot of times we will see employees have both out there. Um, it, you, typically the workers' comp and then the FIHA usually follows, some simultaneously. Yeah, so even if they don't have the FIHA claim out there, it's a potential cause of action they do have that you should be aware of if there is a workers' compensation claim alleging harassment. Yeah, it's it should be the big red flag for you. If there is a psych-related, harassment, discrimination-related workers' comp claim, um, you should probably have your workers' comp and employment law attorneys strategizing yes. how to it's, do it. It's also very important, too, because um, there's a trend out there that if you have a psych claim that you find that there's absolutely no... Um, no validity to that you should just you know buy it out and get rid of it as soon as possible so do a 5000 cnr or 1000 dollars cnr or whatever it might be in order to admit no liability and get it closed so what we're proposing here is a little bit different course of action um, depending on the employer you're dealing with and depending on the facts of, this, of the case but with um, one uh, labor code 3208.3 it's commonly the um, Good faith personnel defense. The full name of it is the lawful non-discriminatory good faith personnel defense. It's a medical, factual, and legal um, analysis you have to go through, set up by the Rolda case. And so it's called the Rolda analysis. Um, basically, what this is, if you have a psychiatric claim and the person's alleging harassment, however, the employer is indicating that the harassment was actually personnel actions, you could have a complete defense to that psychiatric claim. Um, and so the analysis you go through is first you look to see whether or not there are actual events in employment. So these are events that actually occurred in the workplace. These aren't things that were made up in the um, worker's head. So I go in in the morning and say, hi, Eric, how are you? And Eric says, oh, my goodness, that's harassment. That's not necessarily an actual event of employment because it's not a reasonable expectation that that would be considered harassment. Now, if I were to walk in and say it in a very different way and, and an imposing way to Eric and he's very afraid of me, that could possibly be harassment. But the first analysis is whether or not it's an actual event to employment. That's going to be for the workers' compensation judge to determine. The next um, analysis is whether or not there is substant whether or not it's predominant cause. So the predominant cause is 50% of the overall disability is going to be due to work in some way. So if it's 50% work and 50% non-work, predominant cause has not been met, and you could stop the analysis there. You don't have to proceed with the rest of the analysis of the good faith personnel defense. However, if it's determined that 80% of the current um, psychiatric disability is due to work-related actual events of employment, then you proceed to the next analysis, which is again determined by the judge, the workers' compensation judge. That workers' compensation judge needs to determine whether or not those actual events of employment were personnel actions. Those personal actions can be termination, they can be written warnings, they can be good things, they could be promotions, they could be um, demotions, they could be anything um, really that would affect someone's employment um, done by somebody in a supervisory capacity. Next, the workers' compensation judge would determine whether or not the personal actions, so the actual events of employment that have been considered to be personal actions were lawful, non-discriminatory and done in good faith. They don't have to be perfect personnel actions, they just have to be done in good faith. Um, and finally, if all that criteria is met, so you've gotten through those that, um, that four-step analysis we just talked about, the last thing that will need to be determined by the doctor is whether or not the personal actions were a substantial cause. So if the doctor says that 35% of the 
person's overall psychiatric impairment is due to the termination, and then 10% is due to um, discrimination or harassment by the manager, which was not lawful and not done in good faith and was in fact discriminatory, and the remainder is um, due to other causes. That would be barred because a substantial cause of the overall disability is due to lawful, non-discriminatory, good faith personal action, which in that hypothetical will be the termination. So although this seems like a complex analysis, when we're looking at a work comp claim, a work comp defense, it's often a lot cheaper, a lot less involved, and a lot quicker than going through a FIHA analysis. So whether or not the psychiatric injury arises from the personal actions is going to be a factual, legal, and medical issue, but done through the work comp system, you could potentially be saving a lot of money and a lot of time. So I'll let Eric get into the rest of that analysis. Yeah, so the, oh, Eric skipped over, just kidding, just kidding, there you go. <laughs> uh, so the overlap between workers' comp and employment law is we have the same type of defense, legitimate business reason, um, non-discriminatory defense. Um, so it, but when we get to our stage of a FIHA civil action and getting to that stage, on getting to what we call a motion for summary judgment. It is an expensive endeavor, especially for employers don't have that don't have EPLI insurance. And the exposure is vastly, vastly more because it carries with it um, for uh, claims under FIHA if there's a violation, attorney's fees, punitive damages, um, you know, et cetera. So, um, Keith is absolutely right that this is, if, if you see this on the foreground, this is the place most cost effective to perhaps litigate this and vet these issues out. Um, do we want to go per, personal action? I covered personal actions. Yeah. I also covered the next slide. As okay. Well, so, oh, you got it. You can get into this case. I'm behind. Okay. So, <laughs> um, Live versus County of Fresno um, was a case a couple of years ago where um, three Loatian officers had filed both a workers' comp claim for a what they claimed a discriminatory harassing personnel actions based on race, and um, they also filed contemporaneously a FIHA claim. Now, the caveat to this, this um, is a case that has been depublished, which uh, means you can't necessarily cite to it, but the law and the analysis is sound, and why that's important, I'll tell you. Um, the, 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 the appeals board determined that um, the legitimate um, non-discriminatory good faith personnel action defense was sound. Um, the, the action was fully defended um, on the workers' comp level. The attorneys on the FIHA claim filed what I mentioned before, a motion for summary judgment saying, hey, you already litigated this issue. We've already determined that what these supervisors and managers were doing was not discriminatory and was in good faith, which is what we're litigating here in the civil action. And the appeals court said, you're right. It's uh, what we call re judicata. Uh, you've already litigated this. You do not get a second bite at the apple. It absolutely makes sense. Now, everybody was really excited. Well, on the grizzled defense <laughs> side was really excited about it. Um, and it caused a big stir in California. Um, it has been depublished, but there's been no contrary law that I know of um, to say it's uh, it's unsound. And the Reggie Dakota argument, um, I believe, is sound. Um, also, a collateral estoppel, which they also tried, which wasn't uh, decided. So the the reason we bring this up is it presents uh, employers with an opportunity at the workers' comp level to um, vet these issues out, litigate them, especially if they have a sound um, good faith personnel action defense um, on board and to perhaps take it to judgment um, because uh, this still may lie as a way of getting entirely out of a FIHA suit. We'll also take it seriously too um, at, in the work comp area. So if you're going to determine that you want to fight this in the work comp area, don't take it lightly. Even though the exposure is going to be a lot less, if you lose, um, what you've allowed the opposing counsel to do is perfect their case. Absolutely. Um, true. See what works, see what doesn't work, and um, that's not a good uh, tactic yeah, to take. Yeah, it's an absolute strategy um, session, and there will be times where if there are weak points, um, you may not want to do that. You may not want to go 
And there are going to be times when the employer doesn't have complete control over the attorney representing them on the work comp claim. Um, if they don't have choice of counsel, um, they could go to an attorney they don't necessarily know or trust, and they are not taking the course of action they want to take. They're not taking it as seriously as the employer would take it. So this is a really good example of you need to have a clear plan of action between your insurance company, uh, if you are the employer, and the defense counsel to make sure they understand what's at stake here. Yep. And the same goes for when you uh, when you have 132A claims, the retaliation discriminatory, discrimination components of the workers' comp um, saying that, hey, you fired me or demoted me or whatever it might be because I filed a workers' comp claim. When you see those, um, often I've seen that they um, foreshadow a retaliation claim in a civil suit. Um, so you may want to strategize when you see those of whether you want to really litigate that, do depositions, um, and uh, really corner the issues in the workers' comp sector. Um, so it's not necessarily left open for a FIHA suit. That's right. Um, and I, I guess we're not even trying to hide that we're defense attorneys at this point. So, uh, <laughs> oh, were we supposed to hide that? Uh, no, I, uh -oh. I, 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 I always tell Mike there's no way I can hide that. Um, okay, so best practices for you? So best practices in workers' compensation is once an employer is reported um, and they've they've told you it's an injury that occurred at work, um, and it's more than just first aid, so it's more than a Band-Aid, um, the employer should provide a claim form within one working day. So as soon as it's reported as a work injury, give them a claim form. You don't want any statute limitations to toll. You don't want there to be any allegations that you're discriminating against the person because of a work comp injury. You want to offer them medical treatment as soon as possible. If you are a member of an MPN, you want to make sure that it's provided within the MPN. You have medical control over those first 30 days, so you want to make sure you assert that medical control and get as much um, sound medical reporting about the condition as possible. If it does become litigated later on and it's the claim is denied, you lose that medical control, so you do want to make sure you get as much solid medical reporting in those 30 days as possible. You also want to document the process you've gone through, any discussions you've had in writing. Those are going to be integral to your defense later on, especially if it's a contested claim. Um, once the employer returns that claim form, you want to complete the portion, make sure you give it to your TPA or your insurance company right away. You want to make sure that they're in the loop right in the beginning. Um, all the, the best information that I get as a defense attorney is from the investigation that's done by the TPA before the person is represented. They're able to call the injured worker, get their version of events, find out what actually happened before there is any explosion of additional body parts. So a elbow injury becomes my eyelashes hurt and my toes hurt and my skin hurts and my liver hurts. Um, so you want to make sure that that's all documented as soon as possible. It helps out the defense attorney in ways um, that, that are not even thought of in the very beginning of a case. That employer level investigation to determine witnesses, to determine mechanism of injury, um, any suspicious circumstances while everything is fresh in people's minds, and report that back to your TPA. Um, you're all working as a partnership between the employer, the TPA insurance company, and the defense attorney. You want to make um, any reasonable accommodations for the injured worker with the work restrictions promptly. And the most important thing is document, document, document. As you go through the interactive process, document. As you go through the workers' compensation claim, document. As you talk to the injured worker and any witnesses, document. So you want to document. Document? Did I mention document? Well, I document. guess, let's see, employer best practice. Yeah, document. It's document, basically, yeah. to nutshell it, it's document. <laughs> um, so in, for, for our area, it's really about the leave of absent policy absence policies, make sure they are up to date, make sure they are compliant, make sure they are not your uh, a first exhibit um, for a plaintiff's attorney, that you're not engaging the interactive process, um, make sure they're vetted out um, and up to date. Uh, along those lines, make sure that your leave policies for paid sick leave are compliant. Um, that is really going to be a big issue right now. Uh, are you meeting the minimum requirements um, for state uh, paid sick leave? Are you meeting the requirements of your own um, uh, leave policies? If you have a, uh, a, a leave policy that you've created, um, it has to meet absolutely the minimum requirements. And with that, now we have new um, ordinances that are coming out every day. San Francisco has some for paid sick leave um, that came out. San Diego has some that are a little bit broader for paid sick leave that may encompass um, just uh, em employees who have to stay home because their kids are out of school and it's paid. 
Um, so you have to keep track of um, of these leaves and make sure that they're properly documented in your uh, in your policies. The big one is, in addition to documentation, is training. Training is everything. Um, uh, I know my HR and risk managers have you know heard and seen you know all of the things we're talking about. But the people who most often need to hear this are their managers, supervisors, decision makers that don't have this on their radar to make sure they're being compliant. Um, we have a couple of questions before we go. Um, do we have to return to the PTP, the pri primary treating physician, to resolve medical issues per the labor code? Uh, I'm not sure if that's a workers' comp question from a ADA FIHA component. It doesn't matter if it's from a PTP or any other doctor. Um, you have to take a global analysis of it and have the interactive process with the um, employee to determine what exactly their limitations are. And then after that, you document what they told you, and then you have them bring back a document that confirms that. And from a work comp point of view, um, we're not able we're not able to go outside of the primary treating physician or secondary treating physicians that have been elected by the injured worker. Um, we're not allowed to go out and get a competing um, PTP report from a doctor that we want. If we want to make some sort of like what I was saying before, if there's competing reports, was the PTP and the PQME regarding work restrictions, and you have a policy to go to occupational health to determine work restrictions, that's permissible. However, it's not going to be admissible for um, to determine a whole person impairment. So you're not able to go outside the PTP in order to get a competing report that's going to be considered admissible. Um, the days of the competing QMEs, the PTP versus defense QME and AFCA QME, those are over. So we do have to stay within the system. If you disagree with the PTP, the, off, the option is to object and go forward with a QME or agree to an AME between the parties. Typically, it's to go to QME. That's what I recommend I mean, in order to resolve that dispute. So there are medical reports you're going to have to rely on are either the PTP or the QME or the AME. And we have one uh, time for one more question. Uh, California has encouraged everyone over 65 to stay home. How do we document and track this for employees? What are the requirements for them to return to work? Um, do they qualify for benefits? So um, this uh, touches on my overarching theme of we have to be consistent of how we apply um, these requirements in the workplace. Um, yes, there has been um, uh, statistics and, um, uh, in, in the state and federal encouraging certain demographics to stay home, but they're not requiring it. Employers should not be singling out a category of people because um, as it stands right now, the law does not protect you from a discrimination suit later that says they sent me home and I didn't get paid um, because I am 65 or older. That's that's an age issue. Um, if somebody is displaying symptoms, then you can send them home. Now for the people that you have sent home, the answer, uh, the answer is for when, they, what do you do for when they wanna come back? You can ask for medical certifications, but again, don't just do it for your people that are 65 and older or have compromised immune systems. You do it for everybody that you told to go home because of a medical issue. Um, so be, if you wanna protect yourselves, be consistent on this. Uh, last part of the question is, do they qualify for benefits? Perhaps. Um, well, in a case where you require people to stay home and do not give them a remote work option, they will qualify um, for uh, uh, under UI. So um, they will be able to apply because you haven't provided them hours and um, they can get for reduced hours UI benefits. Also, if they have um, an actual uh, condition or diagnose, they have SDI benefits, and potentially, if there's somebody in their household that's diagnosed by medical certification, paid family leave benefits, and also, you have to look at your local ordinances of what's available. For example, San Francisco has a lot broader op um, options for people staying home um, for paid leave, as does San Diego and others. Uh, it's developing every day. And keep an eye on HR 6201 um, to be determined, but there will be um, opportunities there for benefits as well, I expect, soon. And that is all I have to say. Keith, you good? 
I think we're. I think I'm all good as well. Okay. Um, this is the fastest we've ever gone through. We that have. Cause... That's because we're not answering questions. We don't have questions. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you everybody for um uh for being with us today in both sessions. What? Oh, hold on a second. They're telling me to do something. We're telling you to go to the next screen. Oh. So those are our email addresses. If you have any questions, please feel free to email either myself or Eric, and we will answer them to the best of our ability. Um, again, any work comp questions should really come to me. If you send a work comp question to Eric, I'll just send it to him. He's going to send it to me anyway, <laughs> so let's just save ourselves a step. Um, any employment law questions, I'm going to refer you back to Eric. So and, and send us an email if you want any of the accommodation checklists or templates. Our hope is that during um, this session, the sound quality was better. Um, we'll be able to check this later. In any event, we'll provide both of these recordings uh, and make them available uh, to all of our audience uh, for both the morning session and today's session. Thank you all for attending and stay safe out there. Thank you, everyone.